Hey, good morning. Welcome to Move Ministries. We're going to get started here in Revelation chapter 16. So open up your Bibles. we got to be in the Word of God today. All right, let's just begin in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your Word, which is good and true. Lord, your Word is not only protective, but your Word is healing. Your Word is a balm, Lord. Your Word gets to the deepest parts and the deepest sores of our life and it heals them we thank you for the blood of christ which covers us and heals us and we look forward to all that you have for us today by the power of your spirit lead and guide us into all truth that we may be proclaimers of this great healing in christ's name Amen. Would you do me a favor and just shut that? Oh, no, we're waiting for one more. Okay, we'll shut that all the way so that we don't have that background noise. Okay, so like I said, open up your Bibles. We're in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. So um, I just think this is super cool how God so often sets me up. Like, you know, when I'm getting ready to 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 um, introduce to you whatever this chapter is, I kind of pray and I'm like, Lord, how do you want me to introduce this? And I cannot tell you the amount of times that he brings me to certain scriptures like the morning of and says, oh, you know, I'm going to speak to you through this. So yesterday I was at a doctor's appointment with my daughter and the doctor talked about something called the healing crisis. Have you ever heard of this? The healing crisis. This is the first time I have ever heard of this. So, and it, it so mirrors what we're seeing here. So what the healing crisis is, is when the body, when you are, a, and, and this is not something that our, our Western medicine typically does. Typically our Western medicine looks at, at, looks at, looks at symptoms and treats symptoms right? Well, when you start to look at the body and say, we're going to heal the body at the deepest cellular level, we're not going to try to heal the symptoms. We're going to look at what is causing the symptoms and address that. In that process, you reduce inflammation, you remove toxins. And as those things are purged from the body, the body actually gets more sick. This is the healing crisis. As those things are, are being removed from the body, I actually saw this happen when my girls were diagnosed with celiacs and we removed gluten from their bodies. They got so sick the first three months. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm removing the poison. Well, that was the healing crisis. And as I look at this passage of scripture and even the previous ones, the earth is in a <coughs> healing crisis things are getting so much worse. Yes, God is judging the earth, but let's just consider this as a possibility that as he is purging these things from the earth and the earth is like, it's, it's almost as if it's getting sick and people are getting sick on the earth. He is in the process of making things right and healing the earth. Something for you to consider, something for you to think about. So last week we were in uh, chapter 15 of Revelation, and this is when heaven prepares for the wrath of God to be poured out upon the earth. And this is ultimately in preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So what does John see in chapter 15? This great and marvelous sign in heaven. He sees these seven angels. Authority has been delegated or given to these angels from God. How do we know that? Because they came out from the temple. They came out from his ruling presence, from his throne. And they have been given this, this ministry, this, this assignment, if you will, to pour out the wrath of God upon the earth. We talked about this last time, but just as a reminder, the wrath of God is not the problem. It is not something that we shy away from. And, you know, when we talk about the characteristics of God, it's like, well, mention the wrath of God last. Actually, no. Be reminded that the wrath of God is not the problem. The wrath of God is the solution. The wrath of God is his, the, his goodness's response to evil, right? Goodness must respond to evil and to make it right. So therefore, his wrath, again, not the problem, but the solution. God is setting things right. God is doing a deep cellular root of healing in this time things were made wrong in the garden 
And you know what I think is so cool? Is that though things were made wrong in the garden, ever since then, there has been this trajectory of God making things right. There is this plan and, and, and it has never been disrupted. We might think that, you know, I love when people are like, what if I, you know, I messed up the will of God and now my life is over. You, my friend, are not that powerful. The wrath, this, the, God's plan will not be thwarted by you. So don't worry, like, take some comfort in that, right? You might mess up, you might do things the wrong way, but you will not thwart the plans of God. Okay, so, you know, I, I think as we enter into to these passages and we get back into these judgments, we can assume like no good is going to be, how, how can good come from something so bad? We are going to see that even in these judgments, even in these things, God's grace is still there. The opportunity to repent is still there and it's amazing and it's awesome and you know we almost have to ask the question if his grace wasn't enough to wake up wicked hearts will his wrath be you have the choice his grace or his wrath all right let's read through revelation 16 we're going to go through the first 11 verses and the first five judgment bull judgments today then i heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast who worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. And for they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. They did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl and became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Talk about a crisis of healing, okay? So let's look at verse 1. It says, I heard a loud voice from the temple. Now, we've heard a loud voice, right, in previous passages, and these have been that of an angel. We know that this is God the Father because the voice comes from the temple. And if you back up to chapter 15, verse 8, we see that no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues were finally finished. So we know that this is the voice of, of God the Father. And why is this important? Because I want us to see that, that God acts alone in these judgments. He alone is the righteous judge. He doesn't have a jury. He doesn't have a committee. He alone is the one who is meting out this judgment and I just want us to be reminded of these what these bowls are we talked about this last week but but don't think of like a giant like mixing bowl think of very, a very shallow saucer that even if you just bumped it a little bit all of it would come out quickly severely suddenly it would just be over like that that's what makes these judgments unique from the other judgments is is how they are poured out is it just happens so so rapidly and severely so as Earth can't even really catch its breath, right? It's just one right after the next. Be reminded of that as we go through this. This is a terrifying time. It is also best for us to see these judgments as occurring in a series and, and chronologically. There are those who, who look at the judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the, um, the bowls as sort of overlapping one right after another that you you really have to do a lot of like bible gymnastics for that to make sense these are we have three series of judgments the seals the trumpets and the bowls seven in each the remember the seventh seal 
opens up the seven um, trumpets, which opens up the seven bowls, okay? So we have this series of, of, of 21, really, okay? So it's best for us to see them, <clears throat> this series of, of judgments as, as unique, particularly in their severity and the fact that they are preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right, so just recall here, as we see um, in this first bold judgment, they uh, received this loathsome and malignant sore. Recall that back in chapter 13, verse 16, that those who worship the beast are marked on their right hand or on their forehead. And we know from, from 1317 that you you need this mark to be able to buy or to sell. It was going to make going to make life very, very difficult. And so I think it's interesting with this first bowl, they are now marked by a sore. So let's let's just use our sanctified imaginations here and just, just go with me for for this for, for just a second. In the um, King James Version and the NASB version, it says a sore. It's not plural. So remember the NASB and the, the, the King James versions, those, those are going to be more word for word translations. If that's the translation that it's a sore, it's not sores all over their body. Again, using our sanctified imagination, I just wonder where that sore would be. If it would be perhaps right on that right hand or on that forehead, that whatever they were marked with by the beast now becomes this loathsome and malignant sore. This is the way that John describes this. This is extremely painful. This is this is this is more than just like a canker sore. This is this is the the, the word loathsome implies evil, dangerous, really really bad. And we know the word malignant. Like we hear malignant, and we immediately think what? Cancer right? This is cancerous. This is something that will not heal. This is spreading. It is unrelenting pain. This is our first judgment. And so I think too, it's interesting that we see people who were refused to be marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit took the mark of the beast and now receive this mark. This is what they are being repaid with in full. And also interesting that it specifically says people who are marked with the beast. So I love how God divides, right? God sees, you know, we see the world as male, female, you know, and, and all of our different, you know, races and nationalities and all of this. God sees believers and unbelievers. You are in or you are out, right? Here, this is the, the target is what? Unbelievers, those who took the mark. Now, again, do we see God's grace in this? I do. There's very specific groups who are not experiencing this loathsome, malignant sore, this unrelenting pain. Is that not a witness to those who are suffering? Do they not see those who are suffering and say, look, there are two distinct groups here. You are suffering and I am not. There's still grace in this, right? Okay, let's go on to this um, third bowl. Uh, so, nope, I'm sorry. We got the set. The first bowl is our sword. The second bowl in verse three, the, the second, verse three, second bowl, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. So again, this happens quickly. So these sores come and now the oceans, all of the salt water on planet on the planet, which makes up 71% of our planet, suddenly becomes blood. Okay, now is it actual blood? Is it like a red tide kind of thing? I don't really know. I lean more towards it actually being blood and I'm going to I'm going to get to why in just a minute. But John gives this description that it is blood like that of a dead man. It's not fluid blood of a of a dead person begins to coagulate. Yeah, I see your face. It's disgusting, right? We, like it, it begins to form this like jelly like substance. It gets heavy. It kills all of the marine life and all of the plant life in the ocean. What happens to a dead animal body? It floats to the surface and it goes to the shores. So all of a sudden, the shorelines are full of dead, decaying plant life and dead, decaying animal life, okay? This is going to 
instantly and rapidly change the weather systems. This is going to put to an absolute halt any type of, of commerce or travel that is on the oceans. That will immediately stop. This is, this is, and, and, and I, I want to remind us, it's happening rapidly. There's not really going to be time for man to say, oh, this must be this, oh, it's the red tide. Oh, it's this, or to give some sort of explanation, right? Because it's going to be happening so quickly. I think it's interesting to note too that about 60% of the globe's, the Earth's population lives near the coastal cities. This is going to affect quite a few people. And I was thinking too about the, um, remember this past summer, you know, we're in Wisconsin and when the Canadian wildfires were happening, we're roughly 500 miles away from the Canadian borders. Um, we could smell that. Remember, there were days where it was totally, we were like fogged in because of the smoke. So lest we think we're protected in Wisconsin, let's look at the next bowl, the, the third bowl. The angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. We live in Wisconsin next to a very large body of fresh water called what? Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan. What's going to happen to it? It's going to become blood. We know right now how much living by the Great Lakes affects our weather pattern. All of a sudden it becomes blood and the weather is going to respond to this. Also note this, that 20% of the earth gets their fresh water supply from the Great Lakes. Nine in 10 Americans gets their fresh water supply from the Great Lakes. So not only do you have these malignant sores that you would wash out with water to keep clean, right? You have the stench of more dead marine life. Now you don't have water. Remember, if we go back to some of the previous plagues and we see how the earth was affected, the earth is already in a season of drought. Now we have no fresh water. And lest we think, oh, they'll drink the waters of the, this blood tainted water. For a human to drink water, it is toxic. This will kill them. The overdose of iron will kill people. So now there is this, this dehydration that is setting in. And I think here's where I think we can kind of sit and be like, gosh, like this is the earth that God created. Isn't this a little harsh? Like is this, is this what should happen? I love this because not that not God needs anyone to defend him, but here we see in verse five, the angel of the waters comes to God's defense. Okay, now look, look at verse five. Do you see how it says the angel of the waters? So it's funny in, in, in researching this, people start to like, like make all sorts of hypotheses. Like who is this angel of the waters? Look, he's only mentioned here. It's, in, and I don't think we need to make too much of it because there are other places in scripture where, where angels are, are said to have some sort of ministry or commanding presence, authority delegated to them from God over, um, over uh, natural, uh, natural elements. Like it says in Revelation 7, 1, that the angels held back the four winds. It says in 14, 18, that there was a, an angel who had power over fire. This is simply, and I think it's so cool that it says the angel of the water, particularly as his his actual ministry of water is being affected. He says to God, this is right. This is good. This is what should be done. And here is where I, I think kind of going back to that, like, is this actual blood or is it just like red colored water? I, I do think it's actually blood for this reason. Verse six, it says that they that they, we're going to get to that, they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets and you have given them blood to drink. I think that this is actual blood because of this verse. So it says they, who is the they? Go back to verse two. Anyone who had taken the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. These are all unbelievers. Be reminded that this time in history, there will be unprecedented uh, tribulation for the saints. There will be unprecedented persecution and martyrdom of the saints. So these who are bloodthirsty are now given blood to drink. Interesting, right? And this follows what's called in scripture the law of retribution. I believe it's Latin that says the lex talionis, the law of retribution. This is, this is it's a legal principle 
lest you think that you can take your own revenge. It's a legal principle, not a personal matter of ethics, but it is, it, it's a principle that makes sense to make things right. The punishment must fit the crime. So when you think about murder and being bloodthirsty and God giving you blood to drink, that fits the crime, doesn't it? This is from Leviticus 24, 19 through 21. You're probably familiar with this. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution, but whoever kills a human being is to be put to death. So God instituted this principle of the law of retribution that punishment would not exceed the crime. Okay, think about it as humans. Like when someone does something wrong, we're like, crucify them. Like we tend to like want to go way over and beyond. And God says, no, the punishment must fit the crime. And so here we see that law of retribution being meted out perfectly. This angel says, they deserve it. Literally, that word deserve means they are worthy of their punishment. They have worked for this and they have earned. They are receiving what they have earned. So this is the angel of the waters. And then we have another voice responding. I think this is cool because we see that uh, John says in verse seven, I heard the altar saying. So is the altar itself actually speaking? No, this is the altar of incense that we have seen before, but the altar is, is, is sort of personified. If we go back in scripture um, in uh, chapter six, we saw during the fifth seal, remember the, the martyrs crying out, how long, O Lord? This is the answer to their prayer. God is making things right. He is setting them this right and they are praising him for what he is doing during this crisis of healing. They say, you are making this right. Okay, let's go on to verse eight and our fourth bowl. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. Who has the power over these plagues? And they did not repent so as to give him glory. So on the fourth day of creation, God creates the sun and the moon and the stars, right, to govern our day and our night. The sun is what gives us energy, it makes things grow. It is this blessing, right? And I love when secular scientists like discovered that the earth is placed in such a way and the sun is placed in such a way. So as that if we were even just a fraction of an amount closer or further, we would either freeze up totally or we would burn to death, right? So God has placed the sun in the exact right place. And then he's placed the ozone layer around us so that it will not scorch us. Well, in this bowl, I don't know if, if, I don't know exactly what happens, but let's say the ozone completely disappears, right? And, and now the sun in its, the sun has the power, but God limits that power. Here it says it was given to it. Now God says, you may scorch men. We will remove that protective barrier. And so now these men who are suffering from dehydration, from the sores, from the loss of, of any type of, of, of water, now start to burn, literally, from the sun. It's, it's, ugh, it's, it's horrible. But also, look, in verse 9, it says men were scorched. Uh, a better translation is, is the men. Instead of just men, the men. And whenever we see the, it, um, it, it specifies, it, it, it makes like we talk about the earth. It's, it's, it's one specific group. It's, it's, it's specifying it. That's what the grammar does by putting that, that, that word the in front of it. So again, who are these men? The men, those who took the mark of the beast. So again, that we have this separation, just like we saw in Egypt. Remember when the Egyptians were judged? Um, and, and we'll see this in the next bowl in that, in that, um, judgment of, of darkness, there was light in the homes, the dwelling places of those in Goshen, those who were in um, the Israelites. But in Egypt, there was complete darkness. So God is protecting those whom he has sealed. Those who have been sealed by the beast are experiencing this burning. 
And let's look at mankind's rebellious response, but to God's incredible long-suffering grace. What's mankind's rebellious response? They blaspheme the name of God. I, you know, there is, I can't think of something that just, like, as my daughters would say, gives me the ick or makes me cringe more than the name of God being blasphemed. You know, you hear someone take his name in vain and it just, I just feel like, ooh, because of what is wrapped up in his name, right? Like we've studied the char his character and his nature and we know that it is, it is all wrapped up in his name. And when you blaspheme his name, you are disrespecting and just, oh, it just, I'm sorry, it's enough, but I, they blaspheme his holy name and it just like causes his, you know what it is? It's the spirit in me reacting to that. It is so offensive. It is so deeply offensive. But these men, those who have taken the mark of the beast, so love their sin and are so deeply steeped in their pride that they would not repent. It's almost impressive, isn't it? They know, it says, they know who has the power. They know that this is God, and yet they refuse to repent. Remember, this is happening rapid fire. There, is, there isn't even time for scientists to say, well, <laughs> there isn't time and they're in enough pain that there isn't time for them to come up with some grand theory about what's happening here. They know this is divine judgment. They know this is God. They know he has the power and yet they refuse to turn. But what does this tell us? If they refuse to turn, it means there's still time. They still can. The offer is still good. The opportunity is still there to turn. And yet they refuse. It's, it's amazing. MacArthur says this, that neither grace nor wrath can turn their wicked hearts. Let's go to our last bowl that we're going to cover today, the fifth bowl. Verse 10, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl, interesting, on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And again, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. So here we see that the target of God's wrath, where this bowl is initially poured out, is upon the throne. And what does that mean? That's, that means that this is where the, the Antichrist has his rule and his reign. This is his capital city, but it spreads throughout his kingdom. So it starts here in the capital city of the Antichrist, and it spreads across his kingdom. His kingdom is global. So the entire globe is suddenly put into total darkness. If we go back to, because we know that this has happened on earth before in the, in the, in the um, judgment of darkness on the Egyptians. If we go back and we look at that passage, we see that it, darkness can be felt. So there is a weight to total darkness. And, and you know how when... Um, you know, you're, if you're ever in any kind of pain, like let's say you have a toothache, when does it hurt the most? At night, right? At night. Or like when kids are sick, when is it worst? At night, right? They are in total darkness, in extreme pain. They can't get any medical attention. They can't see anyone. If you go back... Um, if you go back again to uh, to Egypt, it says that people never they didn't leave, they didn't leave their dwelling place for the entire time that it was dark. So people remain in their homes. So there is total isolation in this complete darkness. And again, uh, it says. Um, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to this, that it says that they gnawed their tongues because of their pain. This is a, a futile attempt to redirect pain. Whenever we have, you know, when we have pain in our knee, sometimes people will, will um, try to redirect the pain to somewhere else to sort of as a way of like sort of spreading it out. Mankind futilely starts to gnaw at his tongue to see if he can reduce the pain that he's feeling within his body. And it, it really does nothing. So here we see, and we'll see going forward, 
the the time to be able to repent ends here mankind does not repent this is the last opportunity the last two bowls of judgment will be poured out upon absolute hardness i i cannot end this teaching without pleading with you whether you are in christ or not not you know saying i think sometimes when we say okay if you are not in if you are not in christ those of us who are tune out like well i'm in christ i'm good i must plead with you to seek the healer seek the great physician the one who can heal he may take you through a crisis of healing in which things get worse before they get better but repent while there is time. We are still in the season of grace, but it will end. It will end. And that will be it. Hallelujah for those of us who have received his balm of grace. And here is what, here is our charge. Don't forget those who haven't received it. Share with those this balm of grace so that they may know and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, may we never think lightly of your riches and your kindness, which turn us to repentance. Never, Lord. Let us not store up wrath but rejoice in your grace, for it is great. Sustain us in the crisis of healing, Lord, as things get worse before they get so much better. Remind us, Lord, we are preparing for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So I pray that our hearts would just say, Maranatha, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.